Good morning. My name is Jack Teebs. I'm the co-chair of the psychology section's Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Cindy Crusto, the chair of the committee, could not be with us today because of a family wedding. I'm very pleased to introduce the speakers for this year's annual lecture on diversity, equity, and inclusion, Dr. Aaron Andrews and Dr. Angela Kimmel. Dr. Andrews is supervisory psychologist and co-director of psychology training at the Central Texas Veterans Health Care System. She is also clinical associate professor at the University of Texas Dell Medical School and adjunct associate professor at the Texas A&M Health Science Center College of Medicine. She received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Wright State University and is board certified in rehabilitation psychology. She has completed innovative work to assess and address the needs of parents with disabilities and is co-founder of the Disabled Parenting Project, a resource for parents and prospective parents with a wide range of disabilities that includes professional tools related to disability and parenthood. This work is part of Parents Empowering Parents, a national research center for parents with disabilities and their families, which is part of a multi-year National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research grant for which Dr. Andrews is a consultant. Dr. Andrews uh, has presented extensively to professional groups on disability, culture, identity, and inclusion, and has published widely on these topics, and is a member of several journal editorial boards. She is past co-chair of the American Psychological Association Committee on Disability Issues in Psychology, past member at large of the Division of Rehabilitation Psychology, and chair of its special interest group of psychologists with disabilities. She has represented the association at a briefing on parents with disabilities in Congress and at a White House forum on the civil rights of parents with disabilities. Dr. Andrews has received an Early Career Practice Award from the American Psychological Association, a Public Service Early Career Achievement Award from APA, an Early Career Award for Distinguished Contributions to VA Psychology, and the American Board of Professional Psychology Early Career Psychologist Service Award. Dr. Angela Kimmel, to my immediate left, is an early career rehabilitation psychologist in spinal cord injuries and disorders and the assistant director of psychology training and education at the Lewis Stokes Cleveland Veterans Affairs Medical Center. She is also a board certified, she's also board certified in rehabilitation psychology and completed her pre-doctoral internship at the VA Boston Harvard Medical School and her postdoctoral fellowship in rehabilitation psychology at the James A. Haley VA in Tampa. Dr. Kimmel is a former chair of the Committee on Early Career Psychologists of the American Psychological Association and has served on several APA boards and committees and co-founded the Rehab Riffraff Study Group, a peer-led study and accountability group for professionals pursuing specialty board certification in rehabilitation psychology. In her six years at the Cleveland VA Medical Center, Dr. Kimmel has pioneered a variety of interdisciplinary programs for veterans with spinal cord injury and disorders including telehealth, chronic pain management, and sexuality programs, a community education project on wheelchair accessibility, and an annual birthday party celebrating the Americans with Disabilities Act. She is also passionate about training future psychologists and conducts research in supervision of students with disabilities. She was recently honored with ADAP's Early Career Diversity Award and a presidential citation from the American Psychological Association. Today, we are pleased to have Drs. Andrews and Kimmel talk about cultural competence in working with people with disabilities. All right, so we're very thrilled to be here today. This is a topic very near and dear to Dr. Andrews and my heart. And without further ado, we will get started. It was advancing. This one does not want to seem to work. All right. It was working just a minute ago, yes? Yes, it was. Seems, oh, there we go. Now it's working. Okay, great, great. All right, so these are our learning objectives for you today. To be able to explain the importance of conceptualizing disability as a diversity variable, 
to compare and contrast the medical and social models of disability, to list three elements of disability culture, describe at least one disability identity development model, and to summarize ways in which providers can cultivate a disability affirmative environment. All right, so whenever Aaron and I give a talk on working with people with disabilities, we always like to start off with this exercise, okay? So there is, I will warn you, there is an audience participation component to this, but we're not gonna ask you to tell us how you ranked the disabilities. Rather, as you're doing this exercise, please think about what's guiding your thinking in ranking the disabilities. So, please rank them, I'll give you a couple minutes. Um, you would prefer to have, most preferred to least preferred, if you had to pick a disability. few more seconds. All right, have you had sufficient time to think to think about this? So what what guided your thinking as you were ranking or thinking about if you had to pick a disability, which one you would like? My cognitive capacity. Okay. 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 Excellent. So something you really value your ability to think. Yep. Okay. Other other thoughts? So there and I'll give you a hint, there's two big things that guide people's thinking when we do this exercise. So you you hit on one of them. Yes. The the state that would represent the smallest change from my current state. Oh, okay. All right. So Possibly like is that because of like a value of like independence and your functioning and what you're able to do? Uh, I, I imagine that's part of it. I, I think it's just that I'm used to the way I am. Okay. And I would want to obey the course of the exercise, but do as little change to that as possible. Got it. Okay. Very fair. Very fair. Okay. Other thoughts? Yes, in the back. Right. Yes. Good. Good thought. Excellent. Any other comments? Yes. One that I already understand pretty intimately that's most familiar to me. Ding, ding, ding. That is a big point. So, so I'm so glad you brought that up. So you guys have hit on the two biggest themes that we get when we do this exercise. So the first one, and this is what's really comforting to me as someone who's a disability educator, is that people tend to rank highly disabilities that they're familiar with. Okay, and that's because they understand what's involved and they're not as anxiety or they don't get as anxious about something that they know about. So like I said, that's exciting to me um, because if people know about disabilities, then they won't be as fearful of them, okay? And then the second thing that guides people's thinking is what they value, okay? So what can they still do? Um, what abilities might they still have if they lost other abilities? All right, excellent. So, all right, so how, what do we mean when we say disability and how is disability defined? That's always the way that we like to start. Off. So my favorite way to, next slide, um, my favorite way to define disability is going to the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's what's in the law. Um, so the ADA defines a person with a disability who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity, okay? So initially, when the ADA was passed back in 1990, it really only focused on physical abilities. Um, and then when it was addended back in 2008, that's when it started focusing on other disabilities, thinking. Um, breathing, um, other areas related to like disability and chronic illness, okay? Um, now, so the definition of disability, it not only includes people who have 
uh, current impairment, but also have a record of such impairment, okay? So if you have a record of something like depression or multiple sclerosis, even though it might not be currently impacting you. And then it also includes individuals that not have a disability but are regarded as having a disability. So like someone with facial disformity, it doesn't necessarily impact an activity of a major life activity, but if someone thinks it does and they might be discriminated against, the ADA protects them. So those are the three big components of that. All right, so a few facts about disability. So approximately one in five Americans have a disability that impairs one or more of their areas of function. Okay, so going back to 2013, more than 53 million Americans reported a disability. So this is the largest minority group, and it's also a minority group that anyone can join at any time, and disability is unique in that way. Disability prevalence is higher among women, older adults, racial and ethnic minorities, people of low SES, and then those with less than a high school education are just some facts. All right, so things to know about disability. Um, disabilities can be acquired, like a spinal cord injury, multiple sclerosis, traumatic brain injury, and that's the biggest. Most disabilities are acquired as the result of an injury or an illness, okay? Um, then there's also, with acquired disabilities, they might have a traumatic or a sudden onset, like a spinal cord injury, like a brain injury, or they might have a gradual onset, like multiple sclerosis or ALS that happens um, slowly and progressively, all right? That is compared to congenital disabilities. So congenital disabilities are present before or at birth. It's interesting, there's this assumption that um, people with, who are born with their disabilities adapt better, and that's unsupported by research. And then um, something else that's unique to disability is that people with disabilities may or may not have other disabled family members because some conditions are hereditary. And so in that case, they may have family members with disabilities. Other times, they may be the only one in the, with a disability, not just in their family, but also in their community. Different types of disability. So we've got physical, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, amputation, CP. We also have cognitive, traumatic brain injury, dementia, intellectual disability, developmental, like autism, Down syndrome, and then there's also sensory, blindness, low vision, hearing impairment, deafness. Those are the big areas, sort of like categories of disability. Within disability, there's significant intergroup diversity. And this is one of the things that makes disability challenging, okay? There's not like a one-size-fits-all disability. So, um, stereotypical views emphasize wheelchair users and a few other classic groups as like the stereotypical person with a disability. The other thing is not all people with disabilities are equally disadvantaged. You could have two people with disabilities, same diagnosis, and it affects their functioning very differently. And that's really, remember, the major life activities and the functioning is really how you define disability. So children with physical impairments fare better educationally than those with intellectual or sensory impairments. And then um, in terms of discrimination, those with mental health difficulties or intellectual impairments are most discriminated against in employment settings. And that feeds right into my next point as I start talking about invisible or non-apparent versus visible disabilities. So someone with a visible disability, it's obvious, um, but then someone with an invisible disability, it's, it's, it's not visible, it's not apparent, it can't be seen. Now, 40% of the disability population in the US, as I was talking about, is invisible disability. And you know, thinking about the stigma, the discrimination, people with invisible disability have great impotence to keep their conditions, conditions concealed. And aside from like, so why do you think that is? Why would someone with an invisible disability be less likely to disclose it? The fear of discrimination and the stigma that may be attached. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, exactly, as well as um, all the stereotypes related to disability. And it's interesting when you think about psychological adjustment and emotional problems related to disability, research has found that those with invisible disabilities tend to experience more emotional problems than those with visible manifestations of a disease or diagnosis. Within spinal cord injury, um, we found that 
people who have the less severe and have better function after SCI, like they might be able to walk and um, just need to use, they have maybe some problems with ambulation, they have far more difficulty adapting and adjusting to that than someone who is in a wheelchair, which is very, very interesting. All right, so when you think about visible versus invisible disability, when something is visible, others readily accept it as something that they can accommodate it, okay? Um, it's, you know, they don't have to, people with visible disabilities don't have to prove that they have a disability. The other thing that's interesting is that disclosure is automatic. Someone with a visible disability doesn't get a choice. Everyone automatically knows they have a disability, whereas someone with an invisible disability um, has a choice. And then people with visible disabilities always, or they will be subject to being labeled as disabled, whereas someone with an invisible disability, they have this option or opportunity to pass as being non-disabled. So this is a cartoon from one of my favorite artists who has a disability, and he's trying to make sense of a hum he's trying to make sense of this fact that in people with invisible disabilities often have to prove that their, their disability is legitimate, okay? So it's interesting, this is obviously, um, you know, making fun of like a parking situation. But even in my work as a rehabilitation psychologist as people with spinal cord injuries, they frequently get frustrated if they see people who don't use mobility equipment using handicapped parking. And we frequently have to remind them they could have an invisible disability. Like, you need to remember that. So this is just making, he's trying to use uh, disability humor to make light of a frustrating situation. All right, now, this is another one of my favorite slides. So this really points out that disability as a minority group is still experiencing segregation. Um, these photos highlight a lot of the physical barriers that people with disabilities may experience trying to access um, places in the community, access transportation. We still need to use, in many places, different entrances, um, different, uh, different facilities <coughs> than people who are non-disabled. All right, so back in 2008, an article came out really sort of highlighting what do disability ethics, like what do ethical practitioners need to know about disabilities? Well, you need to know about the Americans with Disabilities Act and how that affects psychologists. So um, psychologists need to know things from like the hiring process to accommodations for both patients and trainees with disabilities to also being aware of like the physical access barriers. The disability models, which we will be going over very shortly, obstacles to care including both not only physical and architectural obstacles, but also attitudinal obstacles. And how um, even if, a, if you're working on an IDT team, not only psychologists can be um, subject to attitudinal biases, but also other members of the team. And that can impact care that people with disabilities get. Developmental issues ranging from um, independence and functioning to issues such as sexuality, dating, having a family. And then you also need to be aware of medical conditions of specific disabilities. And that is something that you need to do your own research on based on the specific disability. All right, so going over the models. So these are conceptual models that help you understand um, how people understand disability. So the first model, and this is my least favorite, this is the oldest model of disability. So this model believes that people who hold this model believe that individuals or families are morally responsible for disability. So like the a perfect line of thinking to describe this model is, oh, my disability is a punishment from God, okay? Um, disability is associated with sin, shame, or pity. It may or may not be based in religious doctrine. Disability is a burden and people are victims. And because of this, people with disabilities can't hold a meaningful role in society. This may propagandate social ostracism, self-hatred, and guilt. And so a perfect example of this is when some charity organizations might use an individual with a disability to get donations, or even when, um, you know, I've seen signs where people are um, on the street trying to get money and they say, I'm, I'm a disabled veteran, I can't work. That's really getting at this model.
All right, moving on, the medical model. So this came about in the early 19th century with the rise of modern medicine, okay? So the problem thing is disability is a problem and we should focus on curing disability. The person with a disability holds a sick role and because of this, they're excused from the normal obligations of society. They're expected to submit to the authority of medical professionals. For example, like social, the social security system is heavily based on this. So um, people with disabilities should receive financial compensation because they are unable to work. Okay, and then if you are, if you try to go back to work, there's disincentives for doing that. Like you would lose your, not only your uh, disability social security income, but you could lose your um, disability like Medicare, Medicaid benefits. All right, the rehabilitation model. So this is an offshoot of the medical model. It regards di people with disabilities in need of services from rehab professionals. For example, it provides therapy to compensate for the disability. So this is where it comes around like learning to navigate the community in terms of using mobility equipment. And this gained acceptance. So after World War II, um, this really um, came into existence because there were so many veterans coming back with um, wounds or injuries from the war. And so this is a perfect example of the basis for the vocational rehab system. Like people with disabilities are able to work if they can receive disability accommodations. And then the social model. This is my personal favorite. Disability is a neutral characteristic or attribute. And the problem is not an individual or an impairment, but really disability is a social construction where the focus is on external barriers, physical obstacles to building access, attitudinal issues such as prejudice and discrimination. The emphasis is on social barriers, um, inhibits those with disabilities from full participation in society. And for me, this model really came into being um, about maybe now 10 to 12 years ago when I first left the United States and went to Greece where disability legislation is not as prevalent as it is here because things weren't as accessible I needed more help my I was not able to function as well as I could someplace like here in the United States where things are more accessible so this is where the disability the social model really came into play for me and the social model is all about person first language we are people first as as opposed to identity first language or you might identify someone by their disability the minority are the diversity model. So disability is a natural difference on the spectrum of diversity. It's a normal aspect of life. It's not a, not a deviance. There's distinct cultural and sociopolitical experience and identity of disability as a culture and disability as a minority group. It rejects the notion that people with disabilities are inherently defective. Um, the problem, so in the lives of disabled people, is something called ableism, and we'll be talking about that shortly. Prejudicial attitudes and discriminatory behavior towards disabled people is really the problem. Um, it's the activist response to historical oppression and marginalization, so this is really the spirit behind the disability rights movement. And then this is identity first language. So I mentioned that earlier. So people who favor identity first language say that if you say if you don't focus on the disability, you're, you're saying that there's something wrong with that. So that people could be identified, like identifying myself as a quadriplegic rather as a person with quadriplegia. All right, now, so I hope everyone was paying attention because just what everyone was hoping for this morning was a pop quiz based on, so I, we've got some photos for you and I want you to look at them and tell me what model you think the photos are depicting. <coughs> So some of them have multiple, some of them have multiple answers, but yes. Yes, yep, so social. So there's nothing wrong with having a disability, but it's the system, the social, um, you know, fix that. That's where the problem is. All right. So this is one that has, that could have multiple. So 
So definitely the, um, the minority with the identity first language, I am autistic. So there's one other one that this, this sort of like, this sort of highlights. Yes, yep, with the he needs, so it's the social perspective, but like not the cure. Yep, great, you guys are two for two thus far. Yep, so he's identifying with the disability culture, disabled and proud. Yep, the minority diversity model. And this is another good graphic from my favorite artist. Yep. Ding, ding, ding. And I should mention, he even took his name, um, the Crip Pen. He's really identifying with disability culture because um, he's referring to obviously calling people with disabilities as cripple. And then he's sort of um, also the artist, the pen. So Crip Pen is his name. So, okay. Thanks, Angela. Uh, I'm going to be talking to y'all about uh, a last model and then we'll I promise, be done with the models for a while. But uh, this model, uh, we call it the ICF, or the International Classification of Functioning and Disability, and it comes from the World Health Organization. And the reason why I always like to include this model is because it's a true biopsychosocial model. And so it's very, very useful for us uh, in uh, the mental health field, uh, and in the medical field in terms of conceptualizing people with disabilities because what you've already learned is that there are a lot of complexities, right? There's social, uh, there's medical, there's personal. And so the ICF model does a beautiful job of capturing those things. Uh, and so it's important just to kind of break out a few terms uh, when you're looking at the ICF. And the first one is impairment. And an impairment is uh, kind of the, the bio part, right? So it's some sort of alteration in bodily function or structure. Uh, and in the ICF, it's not that an impairment is alone defined as a problem but impairment in certain contexts uh, becomes problematic. So impairments would be things, uh, some of the things that Angela described earlier, like a spinal cord injury or an amputation or uh, depression, those kinds of things would be uh, considered to be impairments. And it's important to know that it, you know, when we say depression, I mean, that's not something that you can necessarily see. It not, it's not necessarily structural, but it has a functional uh, piece to it. And of course, you know, we also know that there are likely biological contributors as well. The next one is activity limitations. And when we're talking about activity limitations, these are basically things uh, that we consider to be uh, key elements of uh, active daily life, daily life activities. So things like walking, learning, uh, toileting, communicating, all of those things are considered activities of daily living. And if someone has an activity limitation, it means that they're not able to do those things uh, independently, or one or more of those things independently. And it's still considered an activity limitation even if something that you can do ameliorates it. So, for example, uh, I obviously cannot walk, but uh, you know, by using a wheelchair, then I can still be mobile. But I still have the activity limitation of not being able to walk. Another one uh, part of this uh, model is participation restrictions. And this is really where the, the context of the environment starts to play a more important role. So this is our roles that we are in, uh, in, our, in our lives. So things like being able to work, uh, being in relationships, being a parent. Um, and it, it used to be uh, in previous models and in other types of models, it was really about the the disability residing within the individual or being you know, the individual problem. And in this model, it, it really uh, disperses that and puts the problem uh, you know, in, in both places. So whereas Angela was saying the social model, that puts the problem completely in the environment, in the, in the social context. And the medical model puts the problem 
completely within the individual. This model uh, actually balances those two things a little bit more. So participation restrictions might be somebody who's having difficulty uh, progressing through school or somebody who uh, is having difficulty with mobility. So from the ICF then, disability is this more umbrella term that covers those, uh, those two elements of activity limitations and participation restrictions. So Angela was talking earlier about the ADA and about people who are regarded as disabled or people who have a record of being disabled. And I think that this model uh, does a nice job of explaining what that could look like. So she talked about how individuals with craniofacial abnormalities, they don't really have much impairment, right? If you think about structurally, but there is great disability and that's primarily, oops, because of the social, uh, the social experience of, of going out and having a very visible uh, physical deformity, there's a lot more discrimination that someone like that is going to face as opposed to uh, somebody who uh, maybe has a different type of impairment. And then the other kind of example is that, you know, you can have a, a structural abnormality, like you're missing a digit, uh, but it, it may not really have any bearing on your functioning. Most people can do pretty much everything uh, with they're just missing one digit. So it it's kind of shows you what the, the range of, of this can look like in that it's not all dependent on the disability. It's also dependent on the context. So the ICF goes really uh, farther than any other model has before to address what the contextual factors can be. So you've got two kinds of contextual factors. One is the environmental factors, and those are things that are pretty obvious, right? External elements, things like technology or uh, physical barriers. It can also be attitudes or available services. So these environmental factors can be good. They can help us, enable us. Uh, my wheelchair enables me to get around, uh, you know, good social policies, you know, help people be included and valued in their communities, uh, but they can also impede people. So there can be negative environmental factors. For example, uh, the issues of abuse among people with disabilities is very prevalent. Inaccessible architecture, cold weather and rough terrain impact people with disabilities in, in ways that uh, can be above and beyond what uh, non-disabled people are dealing with. And another example is an inflexible work environment or lack of accommodations. So those environmental factors can either enable or disable the individual. The other contextual factor, and as a psychologist, I am hip hipping hooray about this because personal factors are actually really important, right? Things like, you know, personality. Uh, and, and so many of these models really don't take into account any of those types of individual factors. So uh, the intersecting identities, people, uh, people's gender, age, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, your education, important life events, you know, whether you may have a history of trauma, and then also the developmental stage that you're in, right? So having a disability as part of uh, the process of aging may look a little bit different than someone who has a disability as a result of an accident as a young adult. So uh, the ICF is basically just uh, drawn out here so you can kind of see uh, how all of the different aspects uh, you know, play into the, the, uh, the model. There's some really good resources uh, using the ICF as a case conceptualization tool. And if anyone's interested in that, get with me uh, afterward and I can send you some resources because I think it's a really great way to uh, learn to use the biopsychosocial model to work directly with the, the patients that you have. So Angela was referencing ableism earlier, and sometimes people know exactly what that is, and other times people are saying, what, you know, is this just another, you know, politically correct kind of thing? You know, nobody hates disabled people. That's, that's ridiculous. Well, actually, it's not. Uh, because ableism can take a lot of different forms. And uh, it is very difficult, I think, for people to understand that there are many people with disabilities that uh, have a lot of pride and 
uh, don't hate their disabilities, don't hate their lives, because that's the stereotype that we're all socialized to believe, right? That having a disability is pretty darn terrible. So oftentimes we get in this trap where we're thinking that the disability is what's causing all the problems, but in reality, we're not really looking at the social or the environmental considerations. So a lot of the myths that probably are familiar to you just as a person living in the United States is that disability is a tragedy. Uh, you know, we're always seeing pushes for money to develop cures every March. We have the muscular dystrophy and the, the shamrocks and the firefighters and collecting the money. Uh, disabled people want special privileges. That's another uh, stereotype or myth that accommodations are just, you know, special things to um, just benefit you that you really don't need. Um, another thing is that having to provide disability access hurts uh, businesses, particularly small businesses. So uh, we actually have seen some legislation recently that has eroded parts of the ADA and made it so that it's much, much harder for someone with a disability to sue a business that is not accessible. And the onus is totally on the, uh, the, the person who's been discriminated against to notify the person and notify them again and do this and that before you're allowed to file a lawsuit. I could talk a lot about that, but I'll spare you. So uh, integration of, of disabled children, a lot of people, you know, you would think that would not be something that's controversial, but it's very controversial. A lot of parents, you know, I don't want my child in with those children with disabilities and they're slow and that's gonna slow my child down and you know, that kind of attitude. Um, and then the other thing is this belief that, you know, chari that's what charity's for, right? I mean, we don't need to help people with disabilities through government programming, I mean, they should get it through their church or through um, some other charitable means. And related to ableism, sometimes people just really uh, bat an eye when hearing about this term disability culture because it's something that most people haven't been exposed to ever. And disability culture is uh, similar to other cultures in some ways, but it's also very different. And so I'll start with a difference, and Angela mentioned this earlier, is that, you know, this is a culture that someone can join at any time. It's not, uh, and actually, in terms of straight definition, most of you will uh, be a person with a disability at some point in your life if you're not already. Not to scare you, just saying. <laughs> so, um, but there, there are some um, other aspects that are very similar to other kinds of cultural identities. Uh, for example, um, you know, gay pride or um, racial identities or cultural identities uh, from ethnic groups. And that is that we're also a group of people who has dealt with systemic oppression and discrimination. And so that's something that we share. And not only that, but we, we share this identity of, of having a disability. And so disability culture started basically trying to kind of reappropriate our own identity and begin to celebrate our own identity rather than letting the outside world define for us what disability is. And so the core values of disability culture are listed up there. One you saw a little bit of in the cartoons that Angela put up is disability humor is rampant. It's all about using humor to uh, cope and also to put other people at ease. We're usually very good at that. A general appreciation for human diversity. Uh, and, and one area where we're, disability culture is very different from traditional Western culture is the acceptance of human vulnerability and interdependence as a totally normal part of life. So I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say things like, well, you know, if I get older and, you know, I have to have somebody help me with toileting, although that's not the term they're using, if I have to have someone help me with toileting, I'd rather just, I'd rather just be dead. You've probably heard people say that. But, I mean, I have tons of friends and people in my life who need help with toileting every time they go to the bathroom every day. And they're living very full lives. And so, you know, it's just interesting because we throw these terms around like dignity and what that might mean to you might not mean the same thing uh, to somebody else. And it's very, very contingent upon these Western beliefs that we should all be 
independent and that somehow um, being, you know, being interdependent is, is a sign of weakness and indignity. Other aspects of disability culture are basically uh, problem solving and multitasking. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times we're having to solve problems kind of on the fly, uh, having to be flexible and adaptive, uh, and using non-traditional approaches to tasks. So sometimes people will see me open like a bag of chips or something where I would use my hand and my mouth and they'd be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you can do that. That's so amazing. It's like, not really. I mean, I do it this way every time and if you did it that way every time, it would not be amazing. <laughs> so, um, here's some other pieces. So Angela told you already a little bit about CRIP. So CRIP is that one of those words that's being reappropriated, right? So um, kind of like the term queer has been kind of reappropriated. It used to be kind of more used as an insult, but now people have kind of taken it and used it more as an expression of their own identity. And that's what we do with, with CRIP a bit. Uh, we have a few little terms like CRIP time, which means that everything takes longer. Uh, super CRIP is like the stereotype of you know, if you go into your doctor's office at a rehab hospital, there's always this one poster, I don't know if you've seen it, Angela, but it's like this guy with a spinal cord injury literally climbing a rock in his wheelchair. Um, <laughs> and it's like, I don't know if they think that's supposed to inspire us or what, but we're just kind of like, okay, I don't have to be a super grip. He can just go ahead and climb that rock, but that doesn't mean I need to. Um, tabs is, or ABs, we call them either tabs or, or ABs, which is able-bodied, meaning non-disabled people, and the T is a little bit of a dig because it means temporarily able-bodied. <laughs> uh, we do have some evolving symbols and arts. Can't get too much into this today, but this is an example of the international symbol of acceptance that a lot of people with disabilities are using to show their disability pride. I have one on the back of my, my normal wheelchair, and um, some people even have tattoos of that. Some of the political stances that people with disabilities share uh, are also a little bit off the beaten path. So even though um, the disability community in general is pro-choice, there's uh, some strong feelings about, about what they call eugenic abortion, which means abortion based solely on the detection of disability uh, in the fetus, physician-assisted suicide, and then um, promotion of independent living and emancipation from nursing homes. So it's a, that's a very, very strong value uh, in the disability community that people should not have to live in nursing homes because it's uh, quote unquote cheaper, because it's really not cheaper. It would be less expensive to uh, invest in people being able to stay in their homes and communities, but we have a lot of other factors that are playing into that. So the degree to which somebody with a disability is gonna identify with disability culture is gonna vary, and Angela's gonna talk more about that. Um, about disability identity development, but it, it's important to understand that the vast majority of people with disabilities themselves probably don't know about disability culture and don't subscribe to it. And it's, it's partly because of the, the ways in which we've been segregated and isolated from one another. So a couple of uh, tips before I turn it back over to Angela, and that is, uh, things that you can do to start increasing your awareness and cultural competence in working with people with disabilities. One is get more familiar with the lives of people with disabilities and understanding uh, what it's like to live with a disability. So things that I very politely call hassles um, are everyday experiences. Um, you can be very frustrated, very exhausted, um, just living a daily life with a disability because the barriers are seemingly endless sometimes. It can be very isolating. Um, and if you have a, a visible disability, uh, the intrusive stares, the questions, you know, there's this, there's this social contract somehow that we're allowed to violate with people with disabilities that we wouldn't do in other contexts. Like for example, it's not like this happens every day, but it wouldn't be that unheard of for somebody just to walk up to me and be like, what happened to you? 
but people don't usually do that if you don't have a visible disability. On the other hand, like Angela pointed out, if you have an invisible disability, there's this kind of doubting and questioning. Well, you look fine, you know, why are you parking there? Or, you know, why are you getting to board the plane first? Um, importantly, when you're doing uh, work in mental health or medical work with people with disabilities, Understand that people with disabilities are, for the most part, facing all of the same things that people without disabilities are facing. So our normal developmental tasks, uh, you know, are going to be the same types of things that people with disabilities are going to want to work on. So, you know, being able to achieve these goals, I think we're programmed to think that has to do with whether, you know, how severe is their disability. But in reality, someone's ability to meet these milestones probably has a lot more to do with all of these, these other factors that we've started talking about, all of these different contextual pieces. All right, so let's talk a little bit about disability identity development. And disability identity development is different than adjustment or acceptance of disability, although acceptance and adjustment is part of disability identity development. So when I say disability identity development, what I mean is when do people consider themselves to be persons with disabilities, okay? And this depends on personal, cultural, and disability factors, okay? So personality characteristics, we see that can be a huge factor on disability identity development. Cultural, um, different cultures are gonna be more or less accepting of people with disabilities. I certainly saw that I mentioned earlier. I travel all over and I certainly see that when I go to different places, um, how advanced and how accepting the cultures can be of people with disabilities and not just architectural, but it's also in how they interact with me. Okay, um, and disability factors. So disability factors, so visible versus invisible is huge, okay? Um, sometimes people with invisible disabilities, they do try to pass, and so they may not themselves identify as someone with a disability. And then also acquired versus congenital is another disability factor, okay? So there's various theories and models, and I've picked out three to share with you today. Um, and as I go through some of the three that I've picked to share, um, there are some important features of disability identity. So all of them do involve this sense of, or this notion of excess acceptance of disability or adjustment to, okay? Um, they all involve some sort of engagement with the disability community, because as Aaron said, that's part of disability culture. But really the crux of disability identity development, which makes it different from adjustment, is this question of social categorization and how do you really make meaning of your disability? How do you make sense of that? All right, now, so the first one we're gonna talk about is by Carol Gill, and this is a phase-based model. So when I say a phase-based model, I, it differs from a stage model in that you're not gonna go through all of these, and you might not go through all of them, if you do go through all of them, in a particular order, okay? Um, so coming to feel as if we belong and in integrating into society. So this model was done, was, um, uh, came about back in 1997. So that was only about like five years after the ADA. It was enacted in 1990, but it didn't really go into effect until a couple years after, okay? So back in 1997, being integrated into society was still a relatively new notion, okay? So coming to feel as if you belonged as part of society, okay? Then the, the next phase she talks about is this notion of coming home, and that's really the integration with the disability community, okay? So having relationships and um, identifying as a member of that community, okay? Um, her third phase she calls coming together, okay? So that's where you recognize that because you have this disability, there are some things that are the same, but there's also things that are different or that are gonna set you apart, okay? And then coming out, integrating how we feel with how we present ourselves. So that's sort of that notion of disability pride, disability culture, um, identifying as a member of that group. So this is, this was one of the first and seminal models. Okay, so um, 
going to along to 2006. So this used to be my favorite model because it was, it's very straightforward, very easy to understand. This is a stage-based model and both uh, Gibson and Gill are theoretical, okay? So they, that was not developed through research as based on theory. All right, so this was passive awareness. So these are three stages and you are supposed to go through them in order, okay? Um, passive awareness is where you have some awareness of yourself as an individual with a disability. So like when I have a patient with a new spinal cord injury and I first go in to the, ro the room to evaluate them, um, I always ask, you know, have you accepted your disability? What concerns do you have about living with disability? And sometimes patients have very little awareness of what that's going to be like and they might not even be able to answer the question, okay? Stage two, this is when you start to gain some realization that you have a disability and that's going to affect your functioning as well as your identity and how you relate to other people, okay? And then stage three is the acceptance. And that's really when you not only realize you have a disability, but you acknowledge it, you embrace it, you're identifying as a member of the culture, you're sharing those values, okay? So this is very straightforward, very easy, and it fits really well with my work as a rehab psychologist. Now, so this might be my new favorite model. This was developed through research, and this is a status-based model, and this was a really interesting study where they did um, interviews with um, college students who had all been alive and post the Americans with Disabilities Act, because this just came out in 2017, okay? Um, so these are different statuses. So, and one of the other strengths of this model that I really like is that people who've lived with disability for a long time will identify with some of like the later, the, the later statuses of this model. All right, so the acceptance status, status. So acknowledging and accepting that you have a disability relationship status. Um, this is where you relate and you form relationships with other members of the disability community. The adoption status, that's where you adopt the values of the disability culture. And then the engagement status. So this is where I see some of my more um, folks who've lived with disability for a really long time, this is where you really engage. You might become a peer mentor. You might become a disability advocate. Um, you're going to speak up about disability issues. So these are the folks, um, you know, who've really embraced living with disability and identify as a member of that group. Okay, so now we're going to switch into some of the practical uh, pieces uh, clinically. So uh, it, when you think about your practice, uh, psychiatry or psychology or whatever discipline you are, uh, what we would encourage you to do is assume that you're going to see patients or clients who have disabilities. Uh, when you're envisioning those people you're going to see, envision some of them as having visible and invisible disabilities. So things you can do just even in your own office or your clinic or your environment is uh, look, look around. I mean, are there any automatic door openers in the, the building? Um, are the bathrooms accessible? How heavy are the bathroom doors? How much tension is there? How hard would it be to open that door if you were in a wheelchair? Um, look at the exam room. Where is the uh, exam table positioned? Would there be room for someone in a wheelchair to come in there and, and to turn around? Um, your reception desk, you know, how high is it? Is there anywhere that's lower that if someone came in with a disability, they might actually be able to, you know, see the face of, of your receptionist? And also the waiting area. So those are some basic things, but it's always good to go through and, and do a walkthrough and just, just try to look at it from a disability perspective. Other things that you can do are to try to make known that you are committed to having an inclusive atmosphere. So uh, if you have your own practice or you are the director of a training program, you can say things like, you know, we're happy to provide reasonable accommodations upon request. Even just having a statement like that uh, just is a little bit more affirmative. So if I look at that, I'm gonna go, okay, I might feel a little more safe to disclose that I have a disability to actually ask for those accommodations if something in that, that statement uh, invites me to do that. Uh, being prepared to accommodate service animals as well, um, just, just think about that. 
Clinically, the biggest problem that we found is that psychologists, and I'm talking about psychologists specific here, but I think that specifically, but this applies to many other healthcare professions as well. Um, because in general, we just all have this lack of education and knowledge about disability, disability issues. It's just not been a very robust, robust part of our curricula, not in graduate school, medical school, anywhere. Uh, so it's important to understand that as a provider, you're going to have reactions to clients with disabilities, and that's normal. We all have reactions. Uh, some of the things that you might experience is feeling anxious around someone with a disability. Maybe you're really nervous, like, what if I can't accommodate them? Um, I don't want to come off as insensitive. I don't know what to say. So anxiety is a big one. But even feeling repulsed or fearful uh, and, and even, you know, vulnerable. Sometimes disability can elicit uh, some, some real, real vulnerability fears uh, within us. So it's really important that we examine those things and that we're aware of it. So just like when we're working with uh, people from, from other uh, cultural groups, we want to be aware of our own biases and our own beliefs and perceptions, okay? Because we have them, and so ignoring them is probably not going to be helpful. We are all vulnerable to making some erroneous assumptions about the clients that we work with who have disabilities. One of them is called the spread effect, and this was a term coined by uh, one of the most famous rehab psychologists, uh, Beatrice Wright. And spread effect is basically where we have this tendency uh, to believe that disability kind of uh, encompasses the entire person or that it affects all aspects of a person. So uh, an example is that Sometimes when um, we're talking to someone who's blind, we're talking really loudly. But there's nothing wrong with that person's hearing, but we do that, I mean, we do that. Uh, and oftentimes we assume somebody who has a physical disability, uh, we assume that they, they have maybe cognitive impairment as well, and that's the spread effect. Diagnostic overshadowing is, is similar, that um, we kind of think that the, whatever the disability diagnosis is kind of you know, accounts for everything or has everything to do with the person's presentation. And a really common one is, well, of course this person's depressed. I mean, they have a disability. Well, okay, maybe we should still think about maybe other reasons that could be contributing to the depression, and by all means, let's at least be treating their depression. But sometimes that's not the case. You just need to adjust your disability. Thank you, that was very helpful. Um, so you really don't want to dismiss or invalidate people's experiences. Uh, you know, even if, you know, what they're saying is totally unfamiliar to you, uh, probably the best thing you can do is just, you know, uh, reflectively listen and um, validate some of their concerns. So sometimes, like I was saying, we can misperceive any kind of negative reaction as they're just not adjusted to their disability. And I'm always very cautious with the use of those terms, especially acceptance, because there's just this, it gives off this impression that there's this finite state. Like I've done it, I've accepted my disability process over. But really, you know, dealing with making meaning of disability, you know, that's going to take on all kinds of different forms throughout your entire lifespan. So it's not a, it's not like you can just check that box at any point. Um, and um, yeah, and also realizing that, you know, somebody might come in really angry and that might be the most psychologically healthy experience that they could be having because they are experiencing uh, an oppressive experience or discrimination. Um, so just a short list of things that you should do. So the do's uh, in the do's and don'ts list. If you're working with a client or a patient who uses American Sign Language and they have an interpreter, always remember that you're talking to your client who is deaf. Don't look at the interpreter and talk to the interpreter. Look and talk to your client. Uh, don't try to help people with disabilities without asking. That's a really common thing that, you know, people, especially if they're feeling anxious and they, they want to be helpful and they have all these good intentions, uh, sometimes people will just, you know, interject themselves. So they might just like grab somebody's wheelchair and try to help push them. 
Um, and, and that's a really bad idea for a lot of reasons. One is because it can actually be dangerous. Uh, if somebody is not anticipating that you're gonna like try to help them physically, you could throw them off balance and they could actually be injured. Um, and it also is, you know, and it's a violation of uh, your personal space. So if you think about medical equipment, think about it as an extension of that person's body. So if you're standing next to me, don't like go leaning on my handlebar because you just want to like take a load off. Like that's going to be really awkward for me and it's going to invade my space and I'm going to be like this person has no boundaries, right? So um, ask for instructions. What can I do to help you? So like before you're just very anxiously whisking all the chairs out of your office, like ask, do you want me to move any of these chairs? Or, you know, would you like to transfer? Because you really just don't know. cartoon about the spread effect that Aaron was alluding to earlier, where you've got someone in a wheelchair and then someone with a megaphone trying to, you know, ask what floor he wants to. And I just want to chime in with one more point about the spread effect is people always assume that someone as like bubbly and enthusiastic as like myself wouldn't get caught with the spread effect. But it happens oftentimes when I am traveling to another country, I've noticed, where people want to talk to the friends and family that I have traveling with me rather than me. And so I'm really lucky. I've got friends and family who will say to people, you need to talk to her. Her legs don't work, but her mouth works just fine. Okay? And people will, they will say that as like a point of disability using humor to make people feel okay if they're nervous about talking to me about something rather than someone who's able-bodied. Yeah, we had that happen on my trip here. We were in an elevator at the airport, and this woman was in the elevator with us, and she looks at my husband and goes, are you taking her out of here? And my husband's like, uh, no, she's going to take herself out of here. Like, he didn't know what to even say. So sometimes it's really awkward. All right, some more clinical guidelines. So communication can often be an issue. Um, Sometimes people have disabilities that influence their communication. And so as a provider, uh, you really want to make sure that you're doing a couple of things. One is take the time to really hear from the client. You know, it can be anxiety provoking. Maybe you can't understand this person's speech. You know, don't just nod and uh-huh if you have no idea what your client just told you. Uh, you know, you got to slow down. You got to say, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding you. You know, can you tell me that again? Um, so work, work with your client and, and make sure that you are actually able to, to understand that person. And the more you talk to somebody, the better and the easier it gets because just like anything, you just get more familiar with it. It's like, uh, you know, having, uh, contact with somebody who has a very strong accent. At first, you might struggle a lot, but if you get to know that person, you don't even um, have trouble understanding them later on. Uh, again, asking the client about what their preference is for communication. So um, sometimes a client with a visual disability uh, might want you to give them specific descriptions, like, you know, there's a chair about two feet over to your right, you know, all of those kinds of things to kind of orient them. Um, Sometimes if people have some cognitive disabilities like language processing, uh, you want to slow down and also make sure that your articulation is good, but you don't want to talk down to the person or uh, talk in a way that makes them feel kind of demeaned. It's just that a lot of us talk really fast and I will include myself in that. I usually talk way too fast. The other thing that's important about disabilities is that some of the things that we're trained to do, so right in mental health, we're trained to look at nonverbals and facial expressions and all of these things. And that's fine, but you gotta understand that with people with disabilities, sometimes those facial, uh, facial expressions or those uh, movements or whatever they're doing, it doesn't necessarily mean they're bored or they hate you, but it could just mean that they're in pain or something else is, is going on. So, uh, you know, just be, be aware of, again, how that the medical piece or the uh, biological piece also can play a role. And ask if you're, you know, if you're noticing something, you know, let them know. I'm noticing it looks like you're kind of grimacing right now and I'm wondering, you know, are you responding to something I'm saying or is, is there something kind of physical going on? And you can just clarify that. Um, 
So it's very common to see people all the time changing positions because we have to make sure that we uh, don't get pressure sores if you have uh, sit in a wheelchair all day long. Um, and then also lighting and temperature changes may require adjustments. So again, if you see that a client's verbal and nonverbal messages are conflicting, uh, you wanna make sure to get that client's input and try to figure out maybe why that's going on and not make assumptions or try to misinterpret maybe what's going on. So again, I said earlier that your clients with disabilities are basically facing the normal challenges that everybody else is, is, is facing. So don't assume that the reason they're coming in to get mental health services is because of their disability. It's really easy to assume that, you know, this person is coming in because uh, she just got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis two years ago, when in reality, she's having major communication issues with her boyfriend, right? So it's, it's very important to not make those assumptions. Um, you know, the disability identity literature is, is awesome and it's getting so much better with some of these more recent empirically generated uh, models and measures. But it's just really, really important that we don't get hung up on any kind of linear stages. Like Angela mentioned, you know, these are not, you know, it's not like, the early models were based on the stages of grief, you know, Kubler-Ross, death, right? So that's kind of where uh, that, that can hit people with disabilities the wrong way. Like, what stage are you in? Or are you going through the denial phase? That's probably not gonna be helpful. Um, and then again, really paying attention to all of those other environmental uh, issues and not getting hung up on, on different stages of acceptance. A couple of other things you can do uh, to be more accommodating is flexibility about the length of sessions, timing, uh, frequency, all of those kinds of things, just depending on the person's uh, situations. Uh, you can also do uh, visual aids, written summaries. Audio taping sessions is actually really helpful, uh, especially if you're working with uh, people with TBI or other cognitive issues. Another thing that's important is to always think about the personal strengths of the person. It's very, very easy, and even in the disability literature you see it, it goes to the negative, the problems, people who don't cope well, but oftentimes we forget that there are actually a lot of strengths, just like with any of our clients. You know, people with disabilities have a significant strengths, and so we don't wanna overlook those. I don't know how I'm doing on time, Okay, so I'm gonna just go through this really quickly so we'll uh, be able to end. But basically, I want to share with you about psychological assessment with people with disabilities. Uh, it's really important that uh, we, we do this in a way that is, is fair and appropriate, right? So uh, standardized assessment, sometimes, sometimes certain measures are not a good fit for people with disabilities. Uh, oftentimes people with disabilities are not involved in the sample that the instruments were normed on. And so you wanna make sure you try to find the best instrument that to fit what's going on with your particular patient. I know it's not very fun to read the technical manual of uh, these tests, but you really, you really should because it can help you a lot. And you can also call the test publisher. And so you're gonna try to determine, is this gonna be a valid measure uh, for this person? And the other thing you're going to try to figure out is, do I need to make some accommodations or some changes to uh, the administration of this measure? Uh, and we're so shy about doing that. Like, oh my gosh, you know, standardized, and we know it has to be this way. But the truth is, is that if you give somebody a standardized measure exactly the way that you give it to everybody else and they bomb it because of a disability-related factor, that's not valid either. Right, so you really wanna think about if there are accommodations, and this is not the same thing as a modification, so I can, again, send you resources afterwards if this kind of assessment is something that you're really interested in, but a measure with accommodations may be more valid than not giving the accommodations, again, if it does not fundamentally alter what we're testing, okay? Uh, 
So I don't have time to get too much into uh, the rest of it, but I'm sure we're gonna share the slides uh, so you can look at some of the different accommodations that we might offer people. Um, for example, changing the setting or switching the response format, things like that. Uh, we wanna just encourage you all to advocate within your organization uh, about working with people with disabilities. Include people with disabilities in your, your consultation. And um, again, just having non-disabled allies and advocates is something that can really help uh, promote the inclusion of people with disabilities uh, throughout our field. So uh, we wanna encourage you to try to integrate disability into all of your diversity discussions, which you've done a great job already by having us here to <laughs> present in your series. Um, you know, who's in the community? Who are the disability resources in your community? Where's the Center for Independent Living here in New Haven? How can we connect up with those people so that when we have clients with disabilities, we can get them hooked into uh, the disability community. So uh, definitely a lot of suggestions here uh, to encourage you in your continued learning. And um, that's all I've got. Some of the resilience research suggests that it's very helpful to be in, engaged in something that's larger than yourself. For some people, it's religion. For other people, it's advocacy, uh, other kinds of missions that people get involved with. I'm curious as to whether that's a part of the disability culture and whether you see that as as a, as an important part of, of the you know, coping. Mm -hmm. I, I do. I think that uh, there there's a huge. I mean, people people that are involved in disability culture and identify with disability culture are far far more likely to be involved in disability activism. And uh, so Angela just touched on the disability disability identity research. I mean, there's tons 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 more out there. And you know what we talked about in this presentation was kind of that. Uh, status models in the tradition of Erickson, Marsha, those kinds of developmental models. But there's also uh, models that are more focused on uh, narratives. And I think that some of those capture the experience of uh, not only just connecting with other people, but uh, getting involved in, like you're saying, something larger than themselves, some sort of activism or uh, like Angela was talking about, mentoring, kind of uh, shepherding younger people with disabilities into the culture. So I, I think you're spot on. One more question? I'm just curious. You do a lot of these presentations, and you're, you're almost doing a, an experiment every time you go to another place. And you kind of see, I just noticing you coming here today, and how we have accommodated and been accessible to you and not feeling like we're all that great about that, effectively. What's your, been your experience in, in doing that? And what, what can you share uh, to others when that happens? Oh. Censor what you want to censor. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, I usually notice, and I notice it today, that when people first encounter me, I can sense there's a lot of anxiety. And usually in this professional setting, it's I know where it's coming from. It's like, I don't want to offend her. I don't want us to look like a bunch of bumbling fools because we can't accommodate people. I mean, I know that feeling because I feel the same way when I'm you know, trying to host somebody. Um, but I think that, you know, in, in general, in general, I think responses have been very positive, but we still struggle with things like 
things that where we shouldn't be struggling. Like I'll give you an example of the APA convention. There's way too much inaccessibility at the APA convention. Like one time, I think it was maybe about five years ago when it was in Hawaii last time, um, uh, Nadine Kasla was the president of APA at that time and I literally like accosted her on the elevator and I was like, I, I need you to come with me right now because I wanna show you how I have to get to this room where I'm going to a talk on disability, a talk sponsored by the APA Committee on Disability Issues. You're gonna come with me because I want you to see this. And I walked her up like two elevators and through uh, a back room, through a kitchen. The floors were like so sticky. I literally, like my wheels were sticky coming out. So it was literally one of these segregated back entrances or whatever. and. You know, it just, it was, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good to have to go through those back entrances. They're not meant for people to enter through. Uh, you feel like an inconvenience. You feel like an afterthought. And I was glad I got to accost her because then I got to kind of show her, you know, what that is like. Because I think it's very easy to be like, well, I mean, it wasn't that you couldn't get in there, but it's the, the bigger picture of, you know, what, what are we saying about and to people with disabilities in our organization when you know we're not really thinking about this. But there's been some progress too, so it's not all negative. One positive thing that I want to add that people don't always realize, but I think there's been a great response to is the cost of travel for people with disabilities and how you know I need to bring someone with me to help me travel. And for all the talks we've given, the psychology community has acknowledged that cost and been willing to help us with that. So, um, you know, I want to say that when we do raise needs and advocate for ourselves, I think we've had a great, great response to that. Yeah, that's gotten a lot better, and y'all have been fantastic about that. Because, you know, that's the other kind of, I guess, hidden reality of disability is even, you know, being very high functioning and having a great education and a great job. Having a disability is very expensive, expensive. very yes. expensive. All of the, you know, all of the different modifications and and technologies and <laughs> medical equipment. And, and then of course, you know, relying on assistance, right? If you're not able to travel alone, um, you know, it's, it's not real easy to transfer in and out of an airplane by yourself, even if you're relatively mobile. So um, just a good point. Or something that people don't realize, Aaron and I are both in wheelchairs that we have exclusively for travel because we don't trust the airlines to take care of our everyday power chairs. Mm -hmm. And then so because these are extra wheelchairs, insurance only covers our actual chairs. So, so that's just an example of like the cost and mm -hmm. we're happy to do these things. We love doing them, but that was a great question. Thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It.